Yeah. Okay, so let's start with um, start with the uh, Shema and its blessings. Um, since there's uh, what, eleven of us here, um, let me open up. <coughs> Um, there's a lot of different things I could do on this. Um, I think um, I think what I'd like to do is let's see. Um, trying to pull up the right document here. Uh, huh. Rabbi Morgan, I just posted yeah. a link in the chat for everybody. If you if at home you want to pull up the uh, Shema and its blessing document. Oh, good. Yeah, where is my Shema and its blessing? Oh, now I'm having trouble with this thing. Oh, goodness. Um, okay, so I don't know why it's not coming up, but um, Let's try that. Okay, there. Um, do you see the talking to God document? Uh -huh. Okay. So um, the early uh, and around the turn of the 20th, 20th century, there was a, a Robert Morgan. We don't. We're looking at your explorer. We're not looking no, at the document. That. Okay. All right. Stop share. I don't know why it didn't want to do that. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. There we go. Now we got it. Okay. There. How's that? Yeah, that's it. Good. Okay, so in the early part of the 20th century, um, there was a very liberal Jewish philosopher named Franz Rosenzweig. He died young. He had a disease. I don't remember what it was. Um, and he, he died kind of young, but he was a, a liberal philosopher, organized the first Lehr House, Learning House. Um, he had a lot of uh, very smart Jewish people coming together to discuss topics. And uh, he wrote a book called The Star of Redemption. And um, one of his uh, concepts, one of his ideas was that Judaism is organized around three concepts of God. So those are creation, revelation, and redemption. That God is involved in all three of these things, right? So when we think about God, we think about God as a creator. God is a revealer that he communicates things to us and God who has a role, some kind of role in history and, um, you know, intervenes in history for, uh, to, pro to promote goodness, uh, which he would call redemption. Um, and so these three ideas, he said, are found in lots of uh, fundamental in Judaism, including the prayer book. And so the Shema and its blessings reflect these three concepts, all three of these concepts, according to Rosenzweig. Um, so we'll look at how that, um, how that works. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about Baruch. What does the word Baruch mean? Baruch is the Hebrew word for blessing. To, you know, so Baruch Ata Adonai is the first word in a blessing. And uh, we translate it as, blessed are you, God, um, who does X, Y, Z. So people ask, can we bless God? What does it mean to bless God? And I think that's, the question is asked because it's a mistranslation or misunderstanding of the formula, Baruch Ata Adonai. So where do, what does the Baruch originally mean? Modern language scholars say that, um, that the word Baruch um, is in Hebrew is related to another ancient Semitic language, Akkadian, and the Hebrew word in that language is baraka. And baraka means a numinous power, a spiritual power, special supernatural capability. As an example, in the pagan world, the pagans believed that trees possessed a baraka, a special power. What was that power? That they could die and then come back to life again. Because they noticed that in the winter time, the trees appeared to be dead, the leaves fall off, and the trees appear to be dead. And then in the springtime, miraculously, they come back to life. They sprout new leaves and buds and so on. So trees had a special baraka. 
Another example was camels. Camels can walk in the desert a long time and they don't seem to need water. Their baraka is that they can uh, exist for a long time without, without water. So they possess a special baraka. By the way, the idea that trees have this power is probably the original reason why people say knock on wood. Because, <laughs> not because of the wood of the cross, which is a later Christian version of it, right? Uh, the wood of the cross is knock on wood. Uh, but the original pagan version was that tree, wood is made out of trees and trees have this special power. So you're invoking that special power of trees when you knock on wood. In any case, that's the word baraka and it enters the Hebrew language in a similar way. And the grammatical formula for the word baruch, try to explain this in a way. Um, so, um, so uh, in, in Psalm 145, we say um, that God poteach et yadecha, right? He opens his hand, umas bilakol chai ratzon, and he gives food to all living creatures according to their need. Poteach et yadecha, poteach is to open. But if you want to say the door is open, the Hebrew, the conjugation of that verb, poteach, is patuach. Patuach means the door is opened. It's a condition the door is in. It's an adjective that describes, describes the door. It's open door, right? So baruch is in the same form as patuach. Baruch, patuach. I don't know if you can see that or hear that, um, hear how it sounds similar. So baruch means that it's an adjective describing God. God has a numinous power. God has a special power. So um, the a simple example of that is hamotzi lechem in haaretz, right? What we say over bread. He is the one who, hamotzi, who takes out lechem, bread, uh, right? Uh, bread, he takes out lechem as bread. Uh, uh, hamotzi lechem min haaretz, from the ground, from the earth. He takes he takes bread out of the earth. So that's a special power that God has to be able to bring bread out of the earth. And so when you say, Baruch atah Adonai, possessed of this special numinous power are you, God, because you are able to take bread out of the earth. So now that I, I use that as an example, it's a little problematic uh, because of course bread doesn't come out of the ground. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but um, what does come out of the ground is wheat, right? So God causes the plants to grow. He's created a world in which these plants miraculously grow out of the ground. But God doesn't make bread. God makes wheat, so to speak. Um, human beings have to take that wheat, thresh it, grind the grain, mix it with water, knead the dough, and put it in the oven to make bread. Um, the expression, though, hamotzi lechemin haaretz, actually comes from one of the psalms. Um, and so the question is, why did the psalmist want to say that God brings bread out of the ground? And so maybe one hint there, at least this is a modern interpretation, is that um, we human beings take what God gives us, the wheat, oh. Yeah, what? there's a way you can dial in, dial one of those numbers, and you'll hear him. Sp then you go back to Zoom and join the meeting. Uh, I don't know. Please your phone. Please meet your phone. We can hear you. That's okay. It's a, yeah, the, somebody's having trouble logging in. So the information, oh, if, I guess if you're not, um, if your computer, uh, so if you've able to log in on the computer, you can you can call the phone number. If you haven't logged in, you won't see the chat group, <laughs> the chat line there. Um, th but there is a way. Um, all right, anyway. Okay, so, um, so, Hamotzi uh, Lachemin so, Haaret. Um, so, the, the psalm may be hinting that um, human beings are God's creatures. We're God's creatures. And we take what God gives us, the wheat, and we turn it into something better, bread. Um, that's certainly a very Jewish idea. Um, that we're God's agents 
or partners in improving God's world. So God has provided all these miraculous things for us, but then he gave human beings control to manipulate them to, to make improvements, to fix things, to make things even better. Um, and so that's encapsulated in this prayer, Hamotzi Lechem in Haaretz, because God doesn't really bring bread out of the ground, he brings wheat out of the ground, and he's charged humanity with taking those, um, the, the, the raw materials and turning it into um, bread. But, um, but initially the blessing is, is recognizing God's power to, to create life out of the earth. So that's the purpose of the, let's getting back to our, um, getting back to our outline here. Rabbi, Rabbi yeah. may I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. So um, basically what I, I, this is a question I'm going to make it as a statement. I can't think of another way to do it. Basically what you're saying is that a, a Jewish blessing is talking about God giving us um, uh, the power to do things or his power to, to change our realities from, from wheat to, to, to bread, for example. But in Christianity, it seems to me that a blessing is done over a thing. Um, and, and I've, I've often patiently just told people that when food is kosher, does not mean that a rabbi has come in and blessed the food, which is a common belief. Uh, but what bothers me though, is that there is increasingly in uh, liberal progressive Jewish circles to have, to, to not understand what a blessing is. In other words, we have uh, a blessing over the dogs, you know, a blessing <laughs> or objects, and, and, and it always, just to my ear, has sound so un-Jewish. Ah. Am I perceiving this correctly, or, or perhaps I'm, as usual, being a little bit defensive about something? Well, so, so what, what, I, what I'm suggesting is the word Baruch is, is an adjective that this is supposed to describe God. God, ha God is possessed of a numinous power. God has a numinous power. We're recognizing a power that God has. That's what Baruch literally means. Uh, in the case of Hamotzi Lechem in Haaretz, the power that God has is being shared with human beings because God's power is to create wheat. Humans take the wheat and make bread, but we're, we're acknowledging God's um, source of the wheat and maybe also the source of giving us the wisdom to make bread out of the wheat. Um, <clears throat> Most blessings are of that style, but, but I guess um, what they're used to do, even though the form is to recognize the power of God, uh, let's take, I don't, I'm, I'm not, this, I didn't prepare a document for this, so you have to kind of go back and look at it. In the Amidah, there's a blessing for, um, for uh, healing the sick, right? That God heals the sick. So the blessing acknowledges that God has the power to heal the sick, but in that blessing, we ask God to use that power to actually heal a particular person. Does that make sense? So far. Yeah, so, um, so what, what, in, the, in a case like that, what we're saying is, God, you have this numinous power. Please share that numinous power in this particular way, right? When we invoke God's blessings on you, we're saying God has these powers. May he use them to help you in your life. Yeah? No, I, I, I'm with you. Um, I, I think the concept of blessing in liberal Jewish circles, though, is started to accept a more, much more Christian view of what a blessing is. And yeah. your message needs to be uh talk yeah i mean i guess i it's i i don't i'm yeah i i don't know uh th th anyway i would say this is this is the sort of the way i i think the jewish tradition looks at i think it's not just a modern interpretation i think it's the way jewish tradition looks at what a blessing is that god is sharing god's power or using god's powers uh to affect goodness in the world no i i, I got you completely there a lot of people use it to mean i'm going to to, uh, you know, the rabbi is going to come in and bless the bread. Oh, 
Yeah. So and and me, somehow imbue, imbue the bread with some kind of sacredness. Oh, I see. Yes. Some kind of sacredness. Oh, right. Yeah. No, that and would not be, that would not we, be the case. Right. And we do not do it that way. No. no right. Right. And the other thing is um, uh, the, um, what you said about uh, the rabbi is going to bless this. So it's very clear in Jewish tradition, even the priestly blessing, like the priests do a blessing for people, it's not the priests doing the blessing. The priests have no numinous power of their own. They're just human beings. What they're saying is, may God in, uh, use his numinous power to help you, right? And, the, and it's in the words itself, is may God bestow his numinous power on you. That's what it would be translated as and watch over you. In other words, may God use his powers to guard you. The blessing isn't the priests. It's it, the, 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 the power isn't the priest. It's coming from God. The priests are just asking God to use that power to, to guard over you. All right, thank you. I didn't mean to take you off, off course there. Yeah, okay. So, um, so now we're going to go back to the thing. So that's what uh, Baruch means. So, um, so, the Shema and its blessings is one of the two main building blocks of Jewish, of the Jewish prayers, public Jewish prayers. And, um, and it's a unit. So the unit, the core of the unit is the three paragraphs of the Torah that are the Shema, right? So that's not just the line Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Anai Echad, but then the first paragraph, the paragraph that follows it, V'yahavta et Anai the paragraph after that, Vahiyaim Shemoa, and the final paragraph, Vayomer. All three of those paragraphs are from different passages of the Torah. And at some very early time that we don't know exactly, those three paragraphs were taken together and made a unit. Um, even in temple times, those three paragraphs were already seen as some kind of unit. We don't know why, because nobody was taking notes back then. <laughs> Nobody was recording what the decision was, but we know that very, very early, 2,000 years ago, at least, those three paragraphs were put together and seen as a unit. And then what the rabbis did was they took that unit and they encapsulated it in, um, in blessings. So they put two blessings before that unit, and in the morning, one blessing after that unit, and in the evening, two blessings after that unit. And so the, the, all together, that whole business, the blessings before and after, and the three paragraphs in the middle are called the Shema and its blessings. And in our prayer books, the Sim Shalom or the Lev Shalem, um, it's indicated that way. If you look at the header at the beginning of that section, it'll say the Shema and its blessings. And um, so that's the unit of prayer. So, um, the, so now we're going to go to the... Um, in the evening, the first blessing before the Shema is about God's creating the heavens and the earth with an emphasis on nightfall, because it's in the evening. And in the morning, the first blessing is about God's creating the heavens and the earth with an emphasis on light, because the sun just came up. Right? So with me so far? We'll go back and look at the details in a minute. And... Um, so that's all the first blessing. The second blessing before the Shema in the evening and in the, in the morning are very, very similar. In the evening, it's Ahabat Olam, with an everlasting love, you have loved your people Israel. And in the morning, it's Ahava Rabbah, with a great love, you have loved Israel. Very similar. What modern um, prayer book scholars say is that there were two versions of this blessing, or, or maybe more, but two versions of the blessing uh, became very popular. And um, so rather than discard one of them, they decided to use one in the evening and one in the morning. And basically we always put the shorter form blessing in the evening because people want to go home and eat <laughs> and they don't want to be out late at night when robbers and, and, and wild animals are out. So you want to get home while it, before it's too dark. So the evening service is always much shorter than the morning service. So the shorter form of an everlasting love is used in the evening, and the longer form, a great love, is used in the morning service, right? And then, um, 
So that's the second blessing before the Shema. Then the first blessing after the Shema is the one that ends with Micha Mocha Ba'elim Adonai, the rescue of the Israelites at the Red Sea, which we're going to be celebrating in a couple weeks. Right? God's taking us out of Egypt. That's um, the third blessing, and it's the first one after the Shema. So going back to Rosenzweig's idea, creation, revelation, redemption, he says creation is represented in the first paragraph, the first blessing before the Shema, right? God's creating the heavens and the earth in Ma'ariv Aravim or Yotzer Or. The second blessing about God's loving us so much. Why does he love us so much? He loves us so much he gave us the Torah. That's revelation, right? So God's giving us the Torah as a way to live by is God's revelation. And then this, at the Song of the Sea, it's redemption that God's action in history. So Rosenzweig points out that these three blessings are the three, the three main themes of Jewish way of thinking about God. Everybody with me so far? Yeah? Okay, so, um, so let's take a look at the... Um, Let's take a look at the text itself. Oh, crumb. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's take a look at the text itself. You don't see the text, right? You still see the outline? Uh, so let me stop sharing. We see the text. We, oh, we saw the text. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, so we switched over. Work. Okay. Okay, never mind. Okay, good. That's All it. Right, yep. So as long as I'm in, as long as I stay in, um, my PDF reader, I can switch between things. That's great. Okay, um, so um, so here's uh, so here's the formal call to worship, right? This is when we we're, we're this is the formal say we're gonna now pray as a community. By the way, so let's look at Baruch how it's used here. Baruchu. So it looks like the the prayer leader is saying to bless God. Y'all bless God now, but. We don't have any power to bless God, right? So what is he saying? Um, the one who is possessed of these powers. What I think the prayer leader here is saying is not that we should bless God because we don't have any blessings to give God. God doesn't need any blessings. What he's saying is recognize God's powers. The one who is hamivorach, the one who is possessed of these powers. So Barhu here is recognize the powers, of God who is, has these powers. And we in turn say, Baruch Adonai, God is possessed of these powers. The one who is, will possess these powers forever and ever. Does that make sense? So then you've got the, um, the first blessing in the evening before uh, the Shema. We'll read the English translation over here. Praised are you, Lord our God. Again, Lord is... Um, a substitute for God's name. So let's use Frank because Lord is too, uh, too Lordy. <laughs> we're, we're calling God by God's name. Blessed are you, Frank, our God. I guess Frank sounds a little too informal. Um, yud hey vav hey, right? Blessed are you, uh, yud hey vav hey, our God. Uh, king is uh, masculine, but God doesn't, isn't gendered. So let's say ruler of the universe or creator of the universe, whose word brings the evening dusk. You open the gates of dawn and wisdom and change the day's divisions with understanding. You set the succession of seasons and arrange the stars in the sky according to your will. So ancient people used to be able to tell the time of year, not only by the weather, but also by the constellations that were in the sky, right? There's different constellations in the Winter time versus the summertime. So this is saying, this is kind of a recognition that God's universe is amazingly structured and organized so that if you look up at the sky, you know what time of year it is, right? Um, you create day and night, rolling light from darkness and darkness from light. Um, so every day is uh, structured. So we have a way to keep track of our, our time by the days, by the sunrise and sunset. 
and then by the seasons with the stars, and by months with the moon. The moon used to determine the months. So we, we, the universe is so highly structured and uh, organized by time that it helps us organize our time. That's one of, the, one of the amazing ways, just one of the amazing ways that the universe is organized and structured, that we're so grateful to God for having this sort of built into our life. Your rule will embrace forever praised are you for each evening's dusk. So that's the evening prayer that talks about God's creation. Now we're going to go down to the morning blessing before the Shema. So here it says, praised are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, creating light, right? Because the emphasis now is on daytime, fashioning darkness, ordaining the order of all creation. That's not exactly a translation. Take a look over here on the on the right, yotzer or, which means yotzer is to fashion light, or uvore choshek, he creates darkness, ose shalom, he makes peace, uvore et hakol, he um, creates everything. Now, I want to go for a minute to the other text. Okay, so the text is originally, like I pointed out last time, the rabbis often use a quote from the Bible to create their prayers. So this opening verse in Yotzer Or is from Isaiah 45, 7. So here, let's look at what he says. Yotzer Or fashions light, uver e makes darkness. Ose shalom, he makes peace. But now it's a little different. Uvore ra, he creates evil. <laughs> Translated over here in the English as, I make wheel and create woe. That's kind of Shakespearean. Um, <laughs> right? He makes peace and creates evil. What is Isaiah saying? God makes evil in the world? Ani Adonai Ose Kol Ela. I am God who makes all of these. So what Isaiah is trying to say, I think, is... We are strict monotheists. The only creator there exists in the universe is the one God. If something in the universe seems to be bad, there wasn't an alternate God who created that. Everything in the universe comes from God. So things that seem to us bad must also come from God. That's Isaiah. Remember that Isaiah is speaking at a time before monotheism was really fully grasped by everybody. People still were having a hard time getting this idea that there's only one God, and he wants to really pound that message home. There's only one God. Whatever you see in the universe, it comes from God. Even things you think are bad come from God. That's what Isaiah wanted to say. But by the time it gets to the rabbis, you know, some 1,500 years later, <laughs> Uh, the rabbis are saying, well, we don't want to tell people that God creates evil. Um, you know, I mean, then you get into this whole theological discussion. What is evil? What is bad? And um, that's the subject of another class. Uh, but they didn't want to get into that right now um, with um, lay people. The prayer book is for lay people. So they changed Isaiah's words, which they sometimes feel they can do. Right, so they did it here. So it's Ose Shalom, he creates peace, Uvore et Hakol, he creates everything. After all, that is what Isaiah was trying to say, that God is the source of everything. They just didn't want to emphasize that that includes things we think that are not so good. Everybody okay so far? Okay, so then, um, I, as I mentioned in the morning service, um, things get much longer than in the evening service. So remember, it was just one paragraph, Ma'ari Varavim. The morning service, look, it starts here with that opening line, and then it goes on four paragraphs, right? Um, all the way down to here, creator of great lights. So what happened? Let's take a look at some of what it says. You illumine the world and its creatures with mercy, Right? We're still talking about light, right? God's creating everything, but the emphasis is on light, because so the sun came up. So you illuminate the world and its creatures with mercy. 
We're happy that the sun is up because we can see. We're less afraid when the light is on. Um, it provides warmth, it provides light. We're generally happier um, in the daytime than at nighttime. So thank you, God, for illuminating the world. In your goodness, day after day, you renew creation. This was a concept that God didn't just create the world and then disappear, that every single day, God is involved in, in making every minute happen. Almost like if God stopped thinking, the world would cease to exist. So as long as God is thinking, the world continues to function the way it's supposed to. That's kind of the idea behind this. Um, it's a whole philosophy. You may agree, disagree, whatever. That's, the, that's what they're talking about here. Uh, that you renew creation every day because you're constantly involved in making sure that this cycle repeats itself regularly. How manifold are your works, O Lord? With wisdom you fashion them all. The earth abounds with your creations. And we know more about this than our ancestors did. We now, with microscopes and telescopes, can see down to the little details of God's creation, about cells and microstructures and different plants and one-celled animals, all kinds of things. It's amazing. And, and with telescopes, we can see the vastness of the space out there that we know is much bigger than our ancestors could have imagined. And, we're, and it makes it even more awesome. You, God, created this whole thing. The earth abounds with your creations, uniquely exalted since earliest time, enthroned. There's that, that word, Karen, <laughs> enthroned on praise and uh, prominence since the world began. So what does that mean? It means God's in charge. He's not sitting on a throne. It just means that God was the source of all of this. Eternal God, with your manifest mercies, continue to love us. Keep Keep the world in existence. Keep it structured the way you created it. We love you so much. We want, we want to make sure it stays the way it is. Pillar of our strength, protecting rock, sheltering shield, sustaining stronghold. Those are all um, aspects of God's um, love and protection um, in this crazy world. What happens next is... Um, how many people, did you see the movie City of Angels? Anybody see City of Angels with uh, Nicolas Cage? So I'm not necessarily recommending this movie. <laughs> I, but anyway, the movie is about an angel, Nicolas Cage, who decides he wants to be a human being. He falls in love with a human. He wants to be human, so they, they turn him into a human being. Um, it's kind of a weird movie. But there's one scene in the movie which I, just impressed me. And it's a scene where Nicolas Cage is not the only angel in the story. And um, so there's, um, there's, uh, there's all these um, angels. And every morning in the movie, the angels would look toward the east as the sun would rise, and they would sing God's praises, right? Um, so I think sort of that scene in the movie, which was, I, that was like the only scene that's worth watching in the movie. Um, <laughs> At least my opinion um, is um, the what the source of that um, the source of that is this idea that um, in the morning God pray God, the angels praise God, so that's what you have here. Um, his heavenly servants. You see where my little the cursor is over here in the page, yeah. His heavenly servants in holiness exalt the Almighty, constantly recounting His sacred glory. Uh, praise shall be yours, and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, you fashion angelic spirits to serve you. They all await your command. In chorus, this is that scene from the movie, in chorus they proclaim with reverence words of the living God, eternal King, adorning, right? So um, in purity and sanctity, they raise their voices in song and psalm, exalting and extolling, declaring your praise. So what is, the, what is this person doing? He's waxing poetic on this idea that even the angels praise God. So this is one of the many versions we assume of the morning prayer praising God for creation. And in this one, the prayer writer wanted to emphasize the whole world of angels that are also praising God. It's not a thing I'm particularly an expert in, <laughs> but if you believe there's angels praising God, so that's what this, that's what this is about. We're praising God, 
And we imagine we're just like the angels, that the angels are next to us also praising God, right? And so for paragraphs, this prayer writer goes on about how the angels are praising God and we're just like the angels praising God in the morning. So, um, so that's what that is, um, that's what that's about. Now, um, it's supposed to come back to the theme of light. So we're going to get to the last paragraph over here. To praiseworthy God, they sweetly sing all the living, enduring, um, and the, living, um, the living, enduring God they celebrate in song, for he is unique, doing mighty deeds, creating new life, championing justice. Uh, that's God in history a little bit. Sowing righteousness, reaping victory, bringing healing, awesome in praise, sovereign of wonders. So sang the psalmist, praise the creator of great lights, for his love endures forever. That's uh, from Psalm Kililam Chasto, right? He makes the great lights, for his mercy endures forever. And then he asks, so he's coming back to the theme of light, which is necessary kind of part of the thing. Um, for uh, those of you who like jazz music, so in, in jazz, uh, when the, when one of the, uh, musicians is going to do a solo, like the, the clarinet, they're going to have a clarinet solo. So he starts going off in his own little thing. He does his riff. He does a sort of, uh, goes off in a fantasy world of his own, but then he has to signal to the rest of the members of the, of the band that we're now going to come back and play together. How does he signal to the band without stopping playing? and just saying, okay, everybody, let's come back together now. What he does is he segues somehow back into the theme of music that they were playing before. And that's the signal to the rest of the players that they're supposed to come in and join him, right? And finish the song, right? Um, so it's the same kind of thing here. Um, what happens is the prayer, the guy who wrote this prayer went off into his own fantasy world about the angels praising God but now he has to bring everybody back together again. And the way to do that is to signal we're coming back. And so what is the theme of the prayer? It's about light. So he reintroduces the concept of light by citing the psalmist. Praise are you the creator of lo great lights for his love endures forever. But then he does something really weird uh, and uh, unorthodox. <laughs> he says, cause a new light to illuminate Zion. May we all soon share a portion of its radiance, right? So he would say, what? I didn't change the subject. I'm still talking about light. But, but it's not the light of creation that he's talking. It's not about the sun, moon, and stars. A new light to shine on Zion. May we all soon share a portion of its radiance. What is he talking about? Sounds pretty seditious to me. <laughs> He's talking about the coming of the Messiah, when a new light will shine on Zion, right? So he says, I'm still talking about light, but really he's not talking about light. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about the coming of the Messiah, when we'll all bask in God's light forever, right? That there will be no longer day and night. It'll all be day. It'll all be light. It'll all be goodness. Uh, the new light to shine on Zion is about the Messiah coming. And um, rabbis objected to this. They said, no, 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 this is the wrong theme. You're not supposed to talk about redemption here. You're supposed to talk about creation here. Um, but this was one of those times when the Jewish people overruled the rabbis. They said, no, we like this the way it is, and we're going to continue to use these words. And so they won. They, we still pray this way, even though there was an objection that it's not, um, it doesn't fit the theme of the prayer. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Rabbi, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, go, go back to the paragraph you were just on. Sorry. Oh, okay. Stop. Yeah, there you go. Uh, when it's listing all these things uh, that he is unique about, particularly the justice, righteousness, and reaping victory. Yeah. Um, how accurate, you, you were reviewing the translations on a couple of other areas. Are those uh, accurate translations, or is that something... Uh, okay, let's see. Um, see where it says reaping victory? Oh, I'm pointing. You can't see. Yeah, I'm looking. <clears throat> I'm going to go over here and look at the Hebrew oh, for a second. 
Ki hu levado po el gevorot, he alone does great works. Ose chadashot, he makes new things. Uh, Baal milchamot, the master of war. Zorea tzedakot, um, right. Uh, he champions, uh, champions justice. Uh, Zeroa nituya, with, with an outstretched arm. So he's uh, strengthening justice, let's say. I guess that's how I would translate that. I'm off the top of my head. Matzmiach Yeshua, he causes to um, sprout, cause, yeah, to sprout salvation, Yeshuot. Uvare Ripawot, he creates healing. Am I, I'm just, is it following? It seems to me pretty accurate then. It was yeah. the reaping, reaping victory was the one that I, but, but you said something about champion of wars or something. Yeah, Norat and Hilot, awesome in praise, Adon Niflaot, uh, master of wonders. Mikhadesh Bituvo Becholyom Tamir Maseb Rashid. Yeah, he recreates creation all the time. Yeah. So right, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, that's kind of talking about God in history a little bit, also, right? There's also a bit of salvation in there, not really about creation. I suppose the writer of this prayer could say, look, um, that is part of the world God created. God created a world in which um the righteous will ultimately um prevail. And uh, God created a world in which salvation will ultimately come. I guess if I wanted to uh, defend the prayer writer of putting those ideas into this prayer, I would say that. Any questions about that? It's, it, it, I mean, you it, it, it get into a whole theology about this, but. So let me do one other blessing before the Shema before we close. And that's the second blessing before the Shema. So in the evening and the morning, it's pretty similar. So the second blessing in the evening is Ahavat Olam, with constancy or with an everlasting love. You have loved the people of Israel, teaching us Torah and mitzvot. How much does God love us? He loves us so much he gave us the law. <laughs> um, I used to argue that this may be a response to Paul, but um, scholars in the area tell me that uh, that may not be the case. Um, Paul and the Christian world seem to want to oppose love and law, right? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, our relationship with God is based on laws. And, um, and the New Covenant, the New Testament, the new relationship with God is about love. Jesus is about love. Moses was about law, right? And in Paul's thinking, the two are in conflict with each other. Um, that really God is ultimately about love and not about this uh, restrictions and law. Um, so whether this is a response to Paul or not, um, it, it does reflect the Jewish view that they're not in conflict, that God loves us so much, it's because he loves us that he gave us the laws. Much like a parent, you know, tries to teach their children to be good and kind and, uh, and not selfish, and also rules like looking both ways before you cross the street, and in this time, maybe to, if you're going out uh, to the grocery store to put on a mask, <laughs> to be safe and careful, right? Um, you, much as parents try to teach their kids to behave and do certain things and follow rules, God loves us so much, he gave us rules to help us to become better human beings. We see the love and law are two sides of the same coin, that God's love is expressed in the laws that he gave us. Um, and that's really, so it's about revelation, like uh, Franz Rosenzweig said, about God giving us the Torah, but it's also um, about God's love for us, um, that he gave us these rules. Therefore, Lord our God, when we lie down to sleep and when we wake up, why those times? Because that's what it says in the Shema, B'shach b'chav kumecha, when you lie down and when you rise up. So it's echoing that paragraph in the Shema here. So every day and night when we go to sleep and when we wake, we will think of your laws. And by the way, uh, one other thing. Um, sorry. In poetry, um, uh, or in literature sometimes, liter literary people say, uh, if you say, um, I am the first and I am the last. That's a quote from the New Testament, right? I am the alpha and the omega, right? That concept is not just about I am A and Z. I'm everything in between, B, C, D, E, F, and all the other letters. It's I'm the beginning and the end and everything in the middle. 
And so when we lie down and when we rise up, similarly, it doesn't mean just at the moment when we're going to sleep and waking up, it means everything in between, right? So that, that's part of the idea there. So now we're gonna go back to the text, right? So great, it's an everlasting love. It's not just at night and in the morning, it's all the time. So when we say day and night, we mean day and night and everything in between. When we lie down and when we rise up and every time in between, we will think of your laws and speak of them. Rejoicing in your Torah and mitzvot, for they are our life and the length of our days. We'll meditate on them day and night, right? And again, everything in between. Never take away your love from us. Praised are you who loves your people, Israel. Rabbi? Yeah. Uh, Rabbi, this is Richard. What, what bothers me about uh, what I think is emphasized in Judaism too much, and that is law. And the reason yes. is because, well, this is a sin, this is an alchet, this forgive us our sin. And yet when we when we talk about Judaism, I always thought we need to talk in terms of love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, and other areas so in the in the paragraph, second paragraph um, after the bar food, where it says, and we shall think of your laws and speak of them. Why doesn't it say speak of your love and ah. speak of them? Right. Okay, so good question. Right. So so here's the thing. Um it starts out with love. And by the way, it ends with love. Praised are you, Lord our God, who loves his people Israel. So um, again, poetically speaking, what he's telling you he, by starting with love and ending with love is the whole thing is about love. He doesn't see it. This is the point. He doesn't see a distinction between the laws and the love. And um, let's think about this for a second. Most of the laws, there's 613 commandments we say. Most of those laws are about ethical principles, about how to behave, how to be good, love your neighbor as yourself, like you said. Uh, there are ritual observances also. And in another class, I could talk about why the rituals are so important. Um, they also teach us certain things. They help to build community, right? They, because we have rituals that are peculiar to the Jewish faith that sort of help us to bind us as a community together. And they also help us to remind us of God's presence in the world. So there's a, like a purpose to the rituals, uh, but most of the laws are not about the rituals. They're about, about being good. So God is like a parent trying to instill in us um, a method of a way of life that promotes goodness and kindness in the world. And you want to carry that, that thought one step farther, if, if parent-child relationship between God and Israel. If you are raising a child, almost by definition, to show love, you are going to make rules. That is what parenting is. Right. You, you guide, you, you, coer you coerce, you right. bribe sometimes. Right. But, right. but to show love by simply letting your children do anything that they want to do is right. not we end up with un irresponsible spoiled brats. So, so you should, I mean, the idea that the Judaism is one or the other or more than one or the other, the way Judaism sees God is his showing love through making law. Right. That's definitely the Jewish, uh, the Jewish approach to this. And by the way, so let's take a look at, um, let's take a look well, at the text here. What? Well, I, I just want to comment that I think Dan is right because when you read the first paragraph of the Shema, uh, you see that it is a mutual love relationship, that God loves us and we love God. Right, so he is exactly right, right. So we, the, it's interesting that the second, the second blessing right before, the one that comes right before the Shema is about God's love for us. And just as you said, Richard, right, it's not just Shema Yisrael, Listen up, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But then very next line is, you should love God. God loves us, and it's reciprocal. We, in turn, should love God, right? And we should love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our strength. And, and then 
And, and God loved us so much, he taught us the laws. So now we're saying we should love God so much, we should take to heart this instruction, right, and follow those laws, right? That's how we show our love for God. Impress upon our children the right from wrong, teach our children to recite these rules all day long. When you stay at home and when you're away, that's like everything, right? Either you're home or outside your home. So that means all day long, you're going to try and recite them and talk about them. When you lie down and when you rise up, right, again, and everything in between, you should bind them as a sign in your hand. So you, every, you, all your actions in the world, they're on your hand. You should be acting in a way that's righteous and just. And you should assemble before your eyes so that um, they're always in your mind, in your thoughts. And we inscribe them on the doorposts of our house and on our gates, right? So it's, um, Maimonides says, the reason for keeping the laws is not because we're afraid God will punish us or because we want God to reward us. He said, that's disgusting. I mean, in Maimonides' way of thinking about it, that's at least a lower level, or at least you're doing the commandments, but it's not the best way to do the commandments. You shouldn't do the commandments because you're afraid of God's punishment or because you want to get rewarded by God. You should obey the commandments simply because you love God and for no other reason. And you know what's so wonderful about what you're saying is we just read recently in a Torah portion, I can't think of what, what, it, what, what it was in Exodus, that God doesn't take bribes. Yes. So uh, right. look, don't think that because you're doing something that's a commandment that you're going to be rewarded by God right. uh, for whatever you do or because you make a donation, right. uh, to, uh, you're going to be rewarded. Uh, uh, your point is, uh, I, I think it's just a lovely point, speaking of love. Yes, right. So that's exactly right. So there's this parallel relationship. God's revealing God's Torah out of love, and then we follow God's Torah also out of, out of love of God. I just want to point out in this first paragraph of the Shema, right, so besides it being all the time, right, that's what it really means, right? We're supposed to love God all the time and think about these things all the time. We also take these words very, very literally. So um, we should recite them uh, when we lie down and when we rise up is why we do the Shema and its blessings at night. And then again in the morning, because it says when you lie down and when you rise up. Not that you shouldn't think about it the rest of the day, but since it specifically commands us to do it at night in the morning. And, and, and there's also a psychological reason for doing it then, right? Um, um, People who are uh, behaviorists, um, uh, what, uh, what's, um, what's, um, Anna, what's the term for that? Um, is the, the behaviorists, that's yeah. literally what they're called. Uh -huh. Right, but, but not just, it's the ones that, that are about um, changing how you think. The cognitive behaviorists. Yeah, that's it, cognitive behavior, right. Cognitive behaviorists, right? Would, <laughs> right? A, a good cognitive behaviorist would say, well, one way to sort of help you change how you think and how you behave in the world is to create um, set times when you focus on it. So for instance, in the morning, if you think about the, you know, I'm gonna start my day, here's how I wanna behave during the day. Then, you, then you're gonna lose track of it because human beings can't keep track of more than one thing at once. So we're actually gonna go out in the world and do stuff and maybe forget what we were thinking about in the morning. But then in the evening, you come back and, and review your day. How did I do? Right? So again, you're going to think about it and, and, and give, critique yourself. What did I screw up on? What did I do right? right? So in behavioral psychology, this is allowing you to, um, to train yourself so that during the day you will follow these rules. Does that make sense, Anna? Did I say yeah. it right? Yeah. yeah. So, so there's uh, actually a um, behaviorist reason for, um, for actually reciting them in the morning and the evening because it's a way to Focus your day for the day coming and then to review your day at the end, right? So when you lie down and when you rise up, you bind them as a sign. And we take this literally, of course, with tefillin. Um, again, it's just a symbolic thing in the morning um, as we start our day to remind ourselves that in our actions with a, the symbol on our arm and, and in the symbol before our head that we should always think about them. It's trying to impress on us that in our actions and our thoughts, we should try to behave right. And then, of course, on the doorpost of your house is so that when you are at home and away, you will pass by that um, mezuzah on the doorpost. 
So when you come home, you pass by the mezuzah so that you remind yourself that while you're at home, you should think about these things. And when you leave your house, you pass by the same mezuzah so that when you're away, you will think about these things. These are all mnemonic devices to remind us to behave and to do good. I, I have a question on the Shema that you have on the screen right now. It, has, it is um, describes God as you pay Bob pay. Yes. And yet on page three of the first handout that you gave us, it has the Shema as Yud, Yud. Why, oh. why the difference and why have we got, gotten away from Yud, Yud? All right, let's see. I'm looking at the first page here is Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. One, two, three. Look, look at the first handout. It, it's uh, page three. Page three. Up. I'm looking for where that is. Oh, here. Is it in here? No. Not that page? No. no. It, this one? It says a first paragraph of Shema, Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6. Oh, okay, hold on. Oh, that's not in this, that's not in this one. That's in the other no, one. No, it's in the first. Right, the first paragraph. Okay. Oh, here, there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> all right. So I had a theory about that, which somebody told me was wrong. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you anyway, if I can remember it. Yud, hey, vav, hey. So, um, um, well, I'm not exactly sure, uh, so I don't remember how I had this worked out. Uh, oh, Adonai, Yud Elohim, Adonai, Yud Hei Vav Hei. Um, I think um, we don't know at what time the uh, God's name was abbreviated Yud Yud. Uh, that's basically what the scholars told me. Um, we don't, but we see that in early manuscripts already, some, whenever God's, not whenever, but in some cases where God's name is mentioned, it's it's abbreviated as yud yud instead of spelling out the full yud hey vav hey. Um, yud hey. Maybe it's just another fence around another fence. Yeah, it's right. So in other words, yud hey vav hey is God's holy name, and the, originally the idea was if you wrote that out, you couldn't throw that parchment away. So to avoid the problem of the parchment getting destroyed or thrown out or whatever with God's name on it, they would abbreviate God's name with um, yud yud. Um, we think that's probably why. Um, uh, oh yeah, I think the, what I what I um, okay. Here's what I remember. This is what I thought, and then somebody told me it's not true. So God's name is Yud Hey Vav Hey, but we don't pronounce Yud Hey Vav Hey, right? We always say Adonai, right? So Adonai is spelled Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, and in some prayer books. What they do in order to tell you not to pronounce God's name is they they spell out, and I, I wish I had a, a chalkboard here so I could do this for you, but they spell out both names, yud Hey vav Hey and aleph dalad nun yun yud but they they interweave the letters together, right? So it's yud aleph Hey dalad vav nun Hey um, yud did you follow that? Does that make sense? I'm taking the words, the four letters. Okay, here, let me. Pull. Okay, we're going to take the four letters, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, and, and Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud, and we're going to do this, right? So now it's Yud, Aleph, Dalad, right? Um, hey, right? It's Adonai and Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey are interwoven like this. Some prayer books would do this. If you do that, Adonai and yud hey vav hey, um, you have a yud at the beginning, my pinky, and a yud at the end, my other pinky. Curious. You see that the last letter in Adonai is yud, the first letter of yud hey vav hey is yud. So the first letter and the last letter are yud. So my theory was that some prayer books would interweave the letters like this, 
And then eventually they just abbreviated the whole thing and left only the two yuds. Pokemon. I love that, Rabbi. Thank you. I think that I think you're right. That makes a lot of sense to me. But then somebody told me that they have earlier manuscripts with yud yud before the other thing. I don't know. Whatever. That makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know that, uh, how else you would get yud yud as an abbreviation for God's name. But anyway, that's um, that's what they did. Again, it would be make more. It would be easier to do if we had a chalkboard. Okay. Any other questions about this? Was this, um, to tell me, was this helpful? I mean, uh, this theoretically was going to be the last class. I don't know about doing this again next week because it's right before Passover, but uh, maybe in the middle of Passover or after Passover is over, if there's interest, we could continue the class. But if we do, I'm interested in knowing what you all want to learn um, so that I don't just do what I want to do, but what you want to do. So any thoughts about that? Well, I love this class today. Um, if you could continue along this, these lines to um, walk us through the prayers, I think that'd be really helpful. Okay. I agree with Bernice. Oh, okay. So what I'll do, um, so we didn't really finish these, this handout here is uh, we can try it with well, the next time we schedule it, we'll finish up this material and then go on to the Amidah maybe. Does that sound good? Yes. Sure. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Stay safe yeah. and healthy. So I see it's recorded. Can we find this online if we want yes. to? Yeah. The, yes. A link to this will be posted on that page where you got the handouts. It'll be right below the, yeah. or above the handouts. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming right. and participating. Be well, everyone. Be well. Okay. Be well. Be well. Be well. Be well. Be well. Be well. Be well.